so thank you so much for coming out here. Um, we have a really, really exciting talk for everyone. This is an idea that has been um, in the works for a long time. Um, unfortunately, I get to introduce our guest speaker because Sasha's Uber's been pulled over by the police. So. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I feel like I can do it. We have an amazing special guest with us, Professor Chahan, who knows a lot more about this subject than I do, uh, and will give you a huge wealth of information based on his scientific knowledge. So I want to welcome Professor Chahan. And also, while we do the talk as well, just want to remind you there's food over here, there's drinks at the bar. Make yourself nice and comfortable, and enjoy the night. Enjoy the night. <laughs> Hey, welcome everybody. I'm Shahan, and thank you, you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm standing here up high, you know, uh, talking from distance, but uh, I hope everybody hears me, sees me. And yeah, we're here to talk about the concept of extract chili, which is really in the work since about nearly, yeah, many years. What I'd like to do today is not just explain the concept of extract chili, but let's explain also how we, we came here, you know, because when you do research, when you work on a concept, you're not going straight to the, to the solution. We, we had actually a sub trajectory until we find out and we did the research. And so, really where our work started was in 2017. And in 2017, um, there was actually a change in the rules where at the Barista Championship, you could actually change the temperature of the extraction water. So initially, our research on what is the impact of extraction water on cup quality. And that was in 2017. Um, we wanted to know what is the impact of the water that we use for extraction and how can a barista use that and take advantage in order to improve his cup. So basically what we did at the time, we started with several coffee machines and and did a whole range of chemical analysis to find out whether the extraction water, the water coming in to extract, was affecting the coffee. So this was the initial research. And we, we screened the range from 90 to 96 degrees Celsius in order to understand this and enable to, uh, in order to enable the baristas to profit from that and to improve the cup quality. And we took specific coffee, so you see here all the parameters that we used. Now, before we embark into research, we always want to be sure that what we're doing has some impact on the cup. So the research really started with some center evaluation. And as you see, we did here three profiles, three, three extractions, 90, 93, 96 degree. And what you see here, the interesting fact is that, yes, there are center differences. People knew that. Uh, and what we see here, something that has to be kept in the mind, is that the extract with the coldest extraction water seems to be the most intense, kind of the best. The only attribute that was weaker with the 90 degree in this particular coffee and uh, with this machine was the bitterness. So yes, extraction water has an impact on your cup quality. And we see that the colder water or the 90 degree water seemed to be actually a little bit superior but now the question was, what is the reason behind this phenomenon? And uh, here is what we see. Uh, it's an increase in many attributes and a decrease in the bitterness. And if you go into uh, statistics, you can say that the difference between 90 and 96 is really for many of these attributes is significant. It's a strong, significant difference. And even between 90 and 93, there are some attributes with significantly different. This is essentially what we do. We have to be sure that these differences are not just uh, by chance. There were real significant differences if you extract the coffee with different water temperatures. But now the question is, how can we explain that? And how can we take advantage of that? Now the third thing we did uh, in a, I would say perhaps a little bit naive way is because we look into the non volatiles and the compounds that are in the cup, but they are not contributing to the smell. This is a little bit what you do when you look into extraction, 
because when you look at the coffee brewing chart, the coffee brewing chart only is based on non-volatiles, basically on TDS and all these uh, compounds that are non-volatiles. But as you see, we did two different brew ratios, two different temperatures, and here I'm just showing now the extraction yield. Um, there is really no difference. These differences are, are not at all, in, can, can never be the, at the origin of the, of the, of the sensor differences. And, uh, and the question is why we don't see any difference, or where is the difference? Where is the difference that makes really the, the, the aroma or the, the flavor of the coffee so different? Now what we did next is we looked at the extraction. We still focused on the non-volatiles, and what we're seeing here is we measured the yield as a function of the volume of the extract. We went to what we call exhaustive extraction. We tried to extract until the limit, to find out how much can you actually extract in a coffee. And what you see, the line here, the dotted line, is double espresso to 50 milliliter. And you see that at, at uh, 50 milliliter, you already have extracted 81% of what you can actually extract if you go into exhaustive extraction. Basically, what it means is when you look at non-volatiles, and you look into, for example, the TDS or into the extraction yield, with 50 milliliter, you already have extracted 80% of what can be extracted compared to an exhaustive extraction. It means you extract with 500 milliliter or more, you won't get, you get only 20% more. Uh, I'll tell you what that means. Basically, that means, and I'll show you a little bit more data, is that if with 50 milliliter you already extracted 80% uh, of what you can extract, then a little bit change in difference cannot have that much impact because there's not so much more to extract. So in a way, uh, the temperature on this compound that uh, contribute to the yield will not have an effect because you are just so efficient. And, uh, and we looked also into the individual compounds because the extraction yield can be separated like a prism into the different compounds that contribute to it. One is, for example, caffeine. The caffeine is already extracted to 84% with 50 milliliter compared to the exhaustive extraction. So you really have most of it out. And you can look into many different compounds, chlorogenic acids, you have 80%, other, uh, other bigger compounds. Basically, when you, when you look at this, you see that we are extracting between 70 and 80 percent already with 50 milliliter. So the, the non-volatiles are actually extracted very efficiently in an espresso. And here, just a summary, you see that most compounds that, we, that contribute to the TDS or to the yield are extracted by 70 to 85 percent already with 50, with 50 milliliter. And adding a little bit now fluctuation temperature has basically zero impact on these compounds. So the temperature of the extraction doesn't really make a big difference on the non-volatiles. And we did the same thing also uh, uh, for different temperatures on a, uh, on different, with a different extract on a different machine, uh, here with the Black Eagle. Uh, just to show that it's not dependent on the machine. You, we went to a totally different machine, the phenomenon was exactly the same. It's not dependent on the coffee machine. You see here again, extraction yield is 80-81%, and uh, you see the temperature effect, the same, uh, uh, same amount of uh, extraction. Um, the extraction yield will, in this case, will never go over 25%. Even if you extract with 500 milliliter uh, your coffee, you will not be able to extract more than 25% in espresso machine. If you boil, you can go, out, go to 30%, but that's the maximum you can extract. And here, the cryogenic acids, other compounds, ferroliconic acid, just other compounds that are extracted. And you see that just the temperature has no effect on these compounds, or very little effect. Now here, for the, again, the extraction yield, if you extract exhaustively, with 500 milliliter, you can go to 25%, but with 50 milliliter, you are at 20% extraction yield, and temperature does not really have an impact on that. In percentage, on the yield now, not the compounds, you see you are on 80%. So, um, 
we have a phenomenon using different temperatures, we have different flavor profiles, but it is not in the non-volatiles that we will find the answer. The reason for the differences must be somewhere else. Now, we, we, we see sensory differences, but we don't know where it's coming from. And now we did another experiment, which is we looked at the volatiles, the compounds that are contributing to the smell of the coffee, and not to the things that are dissolved in the, in, the, in the cup. And what are you looking here at? You see here, we looked at the volatiles, which is above the cup. We're looking at the compounds that are released by the cup by a specific technique, which we call headspace uh, gas chromatography. And we look at the compounds for a cup that has been extracted, the red at 96 and the blue at 90 degrees Celsius. And what we see here is that systematically a cup that has been extracted at lower temperature has more aroma compounds above the cup. So in a way you would say, if you extract warm you should have more, so you should smell more. But the observation, a little bit like in the sensory case, if you extract with colder temperature, you have actually more intensity in the cup, and we have more volatiles above the cup. And, um, and so this actually triggered, triggered something in my head. And um, because I, was, I remembered what Bert Wood did from, uh, from Taiwan in 1916 at World Barista Championship, where he became world champion. And I guess some people might remember what he did. He cooled his water filter, and he had a strong aroma. And so cooling, it's more. It's kind of weird to say, you know, he cools his, uh, his porta filter, and you get actually a gained intensity. And this has nothing to do with extraction, because we looked at the extraction, we didn't feel like changing the temperature of the extraction water, it's changing the way you extract. So, and this is what Bert Wood did, you know, he, he put cold water, or, um, on his porta filter before he extracted, and then extracted with his porta filter, and he got an aroma that was significantly stronger, and he became world, world champion with his technology. Part of the story was that. That's at least also what he 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 says. So, what is happening here? What is happening really? And that's where, with all these results, we started to think, and and before. I'll come now to this next step, the story, basically, that's where we started to talk to Sasha and share with him the things that we learned and with Hugh and Hugh Kelly. Before going into that, there's a second element that we have to know in the, in the science of extraction that will also be part of extraction. So we know that it's not extraction, it is something after extraction that is affecting the, the richer aroma. And in order to implement extractualing, I just want to show you another phenomenon. Here is a little bit of a complex experiment. This is actually a capsule system I'm showing here. We did the same thing with, with um, also with uh, professional machines. The copy is the copy is coming out here. That's the spout of the single serve capsule. And here we have a system that is basically sniffing. It's a nose. It is sniffing on the copy that is flowing down. And we're measuring how much aroma is in the flow. And, and what we see, a phenomenon that you actually all know, if you look at the intensity of different compounds, we can look at hundreds of compounds here, 90 compounds as a function of extraction time, and the time is more or less the same as milliliter or gram. You see that the intensity of the compounds are all within the first 10 seconds. So, if you extract, your initial few milliliters are full of aroma, and then the second part of the extract, after 10, 10 seconds, is kind of only diluting your coffee. I'm exaggerating, but most of the aroma is coming very early on. That's where the extract is very rich. And then the rest of the extraction is in a way, there's still things coming, but the content of the aroma is very low. Here is the same picture looking from the top, and the red points 
is always the maximum of the intensity for this 95 compound. You see that most of these compounds reach a maximum in their intensity or concentration in the extract that is before 10 seconds. So really, most of the aroma in your extraction is coming in the first 5 to 10 seconds. And after that, you have still, of course, a little bit of aroma coming, but it's very little. And that's the second element of the extract chili. So you see some compounds are coming later, but it's just a small group. And now that's where we come to the concept of extract chili. We know somehow if you extract with different temperatures, you have, you have different trade profiles, and you know that most aroma comes first. And now I'll just go back to the story how everything happened, you know, in, in about in 1918, we started to collaborate with Sasha and his team, with Kelly, on the OCD at the time. So we had research that we were doing on the OCD with, uh, with all kind. He came to Switzerland and he really worked in our lab at the time with his son. And we did all kinds of experiments in the lab, a lot of tasters. And has nothing to do with extract chili, but that's where we built our relationship. And at some point, based on doing research, I started to talk to Sasha and sharing with him these ideas. You know, we have this phenomena, it has a big impact on the flavor. It's not to do with extraction water. And, and then we discussed it with Hugh Kelly and, uh, and, and we realized that what's happening is really after extraction. It is actually the extract that is coming out of the spout that, depending on the temperature, is actually losing a lot of aroma. So we're not focusing anymore on the extraction itself, but on what's happening after extraction. The extract after extraction is losing aroma. And so what we have to do is to preserve, to retain this aroma after extraction. And that's where the concept of extract chilling was born. And that's where also Hugh started to think about it and worked on ways to check that, because at the time it was just a hypothesis. Was a hypothesis. You hear me? Yeah. Was a hypothesis that um, we we weren't really sure whether it's true. So that's when Sasha and you Kelly just took the idea over and tested it. They tested it for two weeks, and suddenly they came back that it really worked. It really works very good. It makes a huge difference. And here we was using the ice rock. Was using. A, uh, here, uh, what is it? Here, that's the way it was initially tried, an ice rock, which was cooled, and the flow was going over this tube, cooled down, and with ice rock, he gained much more intensity. And that's where we said, okay, let's try, let's try to, do, to test it in the lab. And we also tried to cool the spout, which is a little bit more difficult because you have to pull it in the freezer or in the uh, very cold, and then you take it in your hands, you screw it on it while you do that, it's warming up. It's, uh, it needs a little bit of a different setup. But essentially, this was then the solution, and we said, let's test it. Is that really gonna work? So if we cool it after extraction, and we don't impact extraction at all, only cool it, is that gonna give more aroma? And that was then, the idea that we followed together, and we tried two different coffees, which were the coffees. Uh, one was uh, Hughes uh, competition coffee for World Barista Championship in Milan, the Eugenides, and the other one was just a coffee that was, you can call it like a general coffee that should also work. So we tested two different coffees, not just a very rare competition coffee. And here are the results. What you see here is the dotted red line is an extraction without chili. That's what we were doing always. And we put intensity for a large number of compounds, I don't know, 50 compounds we measured. And the intensity of the compound without chili is put at 100%. And then we did different type of extract chili. We cooled only the first five gram, or in fact, the more is the first five seconds, and, and then took the ice rock out. Or we cooled the first 12, 
France or the South Telegram. So we try to put different fractions because we know that only the initial part of extract is really relevant. After that, you don't have to cool. And in one case, we also did the frozen spout. And what you see immediately is, yes, as soon as you cool it, the intensity of the compounds jump up and by 5, 10, 15 percent for some compounds and depending you can also go up to up to 40 percent. So yeah, so the cooling, and this is a technique, we use different techniques now. This is a technique, you don't know how, what it is, it is measuring the intensity of the compounds above the cup. How much is there and in relation to the non-cooled situation. If you put it in percentage, in total percentage, in total, it doesn't look like a lot. 7%, 10, 11%, that's the total increase in the volatiles. But if you look at specific compounds, some compounds are significantly more. So there are some selected compounds that increase by 30, 40%. And so selectively, you will have compounds that are increased or retained due to the cooling. Here we use another technique which is a little bit less sensitive but where we can, we are uh, also used a lot and we know exactly which compounds this is. And what you see here, uh, the, the compounds early on in this chromatogram as we call it, are the more volatile compounds. And if you go to longer times, basically this is a time in the way we analyze, then the compounds are becoming less and less volatile. And what you see is that the compounds that are the most volatile seem to be increased selectively. And compounds that are later, that are less volatile, have, are less affected by the concept of extract chilling. They are more or less the same level as the reference that is not cooled. So this is a second technique, a very different technique of measuring the volatiles, and we see the same phenomenon. It's a little bit less sensitive, but it's good to check it with different techniques. And we see that, and this is for the Ethiopian washed. Now, we, we tried it with a second copy, exactly the same phenomena, systematic increase, depending on the three conditions that we have. Um, um, the same phenomena, cooling increases the comp uh, intensity of the compounds above the cup. Here, the percentage is a little bit different. It really depends on the copy, and there's still a lot of work to be done. And also, if you do the gas chromatography, you see that the early compounds are selected increased compared to the compounds that are coming later. This is the basis of extract chilling. Cooling the extract after extraction is going to make a huge difference, and you only have to cool a few grams or a few seconds. You don't have to cool more than five grams. Of course, the advantage of that is that you're not really cooling your coffee because you can pull out the ice rock and your extract is then cooled normal. And you will have really more or less the same effect even if we cool very little. The, the phenomena is because you really have most of the volatiles very early on in your coffee. So, and that's where Hugh Kelly then went with that to the World Championship. He came all the way to the finals and became third. So I'm sure part of the, of the success of this research is also because he was driving it to his routine and to his competition. And we really pushed it to understand it for his competition coffee, but also with other colleagues. And that was for us really the first proof and the strong proof that this is working. And, um, and so what we did very recently, we had in Switzerland uh, an event called Century Summit that you have also in the US. And at this event, together with Amy and Mathieu from Mame Coffee in Switzerland, I guess some people know them, they are here, I don't know where. Uh, I, I said, let's present it. For the first time, we decided to present it at the, at the event. And I called up Mathieu and Emmy and asked, you know about this? I said, yes, we know, we do it actually, and it works. And so I, I asked Mathieu and Emmy to come to the Sandry Summit 
and to prepare the coffee so that we can all taste it. I gave a presentation a bit like today, and then we had a, an event where everybody, more than 100 people, could taste it. Uh, and here we use the coffee from their own uh, production, from Mami Coffee. Um, and here they are preparing it, and, and they actually prepared in 20 minutes more than two times 100 espresso, one chilled and one non-chilled. And that was given to the people to taste it blind. And they had to evaluate based on a range of attributes how they perceived the difference. And the way they cooled it is that they put the porta filter into ice so that only the spout was touching the ice and not the whole porta filter. This was a little bit also based on the experience and observation also by, by Mathieu that if you put the whole porta filter into it, it actually affects also the extraction because the whole porta filter. If it cools, it changes extraction time, but we don't want to affect the old extraction. We all don't want to affect after extraction, cooling of the extract. That's why only the porta filter was in ice. It wasn't really that cold, uh, so the effect was really small, but that was the experiment, and then every person at the Sanji Summit got two cups, and they didn't know which one was what, and they had to compare, the pair comparison, which one is sweeter, more acidic, more bitter, the one or the two. One was non-chilled and two was chilled. And at the end, we had nearly 80 people who gave uh, evaluation back. And, and these were the results from the people. So acidity, at least for this copy, and we don't want to generalize for all copies, you know, and uh, for all extractions, but here clearly there was a very strong difference on the acidity um, with nearly 90 people, some uh, increase in the sweetness, some increase even in texture. You would say texture is not something that is in the volatiles, but it can be actually influencing your perception from the volatiles. And then very little also in the aroma. And the bitterness was decreased. So that was actually the statistical results from the study at the Sensory Summit uh, based on this particular coffee and the extraction. This was a sensory result on that. So, it works on espresso. Um, and we went through all that, you know, with you at the World Championship in, in Milan, where he was uh, third, you know, and uh, made fantastic results. Now, of course, in the background, Sasha very intensely working on it with us, really exploring and, and pushing this idea further. As you probably know, he, he really became so uh, engaged with the idea and said, I'm going back to competition. And, and so we, together, started now to explore the whole concept for filtered coffee. It should actually work just as well for filtered coffee. It might be different and uh, we, we made uh, an experiment and we are we just in the beginning. It's exploring whether it works for the filtered coffee as well. So we did the same experiment for the filtered coffee. And as, we said, as I said, it should not affect the non-volatiles. The extract chilling should not have an impact on the extraction, extraction process itself. It's only on the retention of the high volatiles. So if you look here, uh, for the filter coffee, um, and we use a setup that is very similar that we're going to just show later for a Paragon, but it was like a little bit of improvised version initially. On the non volatiles and the scale is really very small, so uh, it looks like there is an error bar. It's really nothing. It's very reproducible, and there is nothing on TDS on extraction yield between the chilled and the non chilled. So it doesn't really affect the non volatiles. But if you go on the volatiles, we see here, uh, if you look overall, we see an effect that overall there, there is an increase. Of course, you have to realize when you work on filtered coffee, your coffee is so much more diluted that our local techniques are a little bit struggling with the signal intensity. On espresso, we have such a strong signal that we have much more significance and less variability. But overall, you clearly see that the intensity is increased by about 4 to 5% in this case. 
it's smaller, but you have to realize that filter copy is so much more dilute. And in my feeling that a small difference in filter copy can have a much stronger impact on the sensory than it will have in espresso, where the flavor or the aroma and the taste is so overwhelming that a small difference might not be perceived. So this is, in a percentage perspective, a little bit smaller, but it is, it is an increase, and we see the same phenomena, and we are really at the beginning. We still have to optimize, we, we, we work with a simple setup, but X actually works for filter copy. And, and here are also some sensory data that were done here uh, in the group of Sasha. And you see that the gray bar is the era which is the standard deviation between the red line, which is the red line is the non chilled and whatever is above the, the gray zone is a significant difference in some sensory attribute. And you see that at 50, 60 degree tasting, there are several attributes in the sensor that are significantly increased in this, or significantly different, significantly different. And if you cool it down, you actually observe an increase in the significant difference between the non-chilled and the chilled. So you still, you have the same phenomenon in the filter copy, uh, and from a sensory perspective, it is not smaller. From a signal intensity, it's a little bit smaller, but that's because your filter copy is more dilute. And that's where the concept of Paragon was developed. How can we create a setup that takes advantage of this phenomena in a systematic way and can allow to chill the extract? And this is the setup. I see one standing there where you have you have here the filter, and here you have the chilled ball, and it flows over the ball and into the carafe, and so you can extract, and you can, you can take this out after a few milliliters, just as you want. And as you probably know, Sasha competed, here a typical picture, where he competed with the Paragon setup, and really demonstrated, and people know the story, I'm sure, that uh, what happened at the, at the championship in Australia. The coffee was so astonishingly different than what other did that you didn't even believe it can work. So, okay, so that's it. <laughs> so I'm not sure how We'll do it, whether we'll have a discussion here, we'll have a discussion in the group, but uh, I hope now it's also up, up to the whole community to test. We are really at the beginning of it, you know? We test a few things, I'm sure we can optimize and we can, we can really tickle out the whole phenomena. So, I'm not sure how do we, Hugh Kelly or Sasha, do we have a discussion here, questions, or do we do it just in the group? Please do a quick Q&A, I think. Q, quick Q&A, yeah, we take like a few questions. Absolutely. Um, right. So, thank you, Chahan. Um, that was amazing. I know a lot of technical information, a lot of questions. Um, if we, yeah, if we've got any questions in the crowd, stick your hand up. We can, uh, we can hopefully get some answers for you. Otherwise, we can mingle after and have a chat about that as well. So, is there any questions from the talk? I can give half of the answer, I'm sure Sasha can give more, but uh, really we know this phenomenon has been so long on Espresso and we were waiting and still waiting for the commercial realization of it. There is work going on in the background. But, uh, so we know that since more than a year, but since Sasha and, uh, and Ona really pushed forward on the filter copy and now we have a setup, we said we're going we're gonna to go out. And uh, I think there are things in preparation for the espresso. I don't want to tell you more. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so for espresso coffee, 
Um, I mean, you are roasting differently. It's a very different style of brew. And as we know, espresso is extremely difficult to get right. Uh, so I guess before we release anything, before we present data, we want to be absolutely sure that the results are the results. With filter coffee, it was, I mean, Sasha did thousands of side-by-side -side cups. Like every time I walk past his office, he's like, oh, and I think he did that to everyone around him for six months. And it was very, very, very clear. But with espresso, you've got different roasting styles, which can slightly affect it. So we just want to be sure that we're putting the right message out before. Um, yeah, any future release. That's good answer to your question. In the back. Yes. So we tried actually uh, the spouts or the ice rock was frozen, so to minus, we put it minus 20 degree, and then it was put below into the extract. And we tried, to, tried three different times, five gram, 12 gram, and 20 gram for the espresso. Whereas for the filter coffee, it was for the first 50 grams. Is that right? To 20% of the extraction. 20% of the extraction was cooled, approximately. So we didn't actually play around with that. It was based on Sasha's experience uh, that we tried one time for cooling the filter extract. There are many parameters. I think it will depend on the coffee. It will depend on uh, on other dead parameters. So we didn't explore the whole range of filter, but we did what Sasha find out as a very good setting. Is that right, Sasha? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you jump up. <laughs> oh, you can come through this side, Sash. Okay. All the guys are there. Hmm. Nice to see you, first of all. <laughs> uh, yeah, so what we found with the filter coffee especially uh, first of all, why, why we find bigger sensory differences normally when we roast fil filter coffee compared with the espresso, we usually would roast that coffee a little bit faster, a little bit lighter, uh, which means we have more natural aroma volatiles available for us to sort of see. Uh, but we, we did find that not only difference in um, aroma volatiles, aromas and flavors, we, we found significant difference in uh, how we perceive the coffee, which, you know, texture, balance, aftertaste, etc. And uh, the, I guess the main, the main thing is after we've done a lot of studies is that when we chill extract, entire extraction, so maybe entire 300 grams out, uh, we did find that we're getting more flavors, more aromas, but we also are decreasing certain elements of our coffee. And uh, so we, we found that, you know, after discussing with you that the majority of aroma volatiles we extract is in first stage of the extraction, first 20 to 30 percent. And we, we found that with that, I guess, technique, we are doing 40-60 method, the first two pores we extract uh, by using the rocks, but the last three pores we extract without the rocks. Uh, we managed to sort of increase aromas and flavors and not necessarily decrease other elements like a texture, etc. Uh, so, I, I mean, we, we highly encourage everyone to, to you know, experiment and play with it, but maybe if you keep in mind uh, the roast profile, because we, as Kelly mentioned, when we do have some darker roast profiles in the espresso, there's not much difference. Uh, that we believe that's because there's not as many, this, some of these aroma volatiles are way below threshold, so even chilling work doesn't really help as much. Uh, but uh, yeah, when you're experimenting with it, try to stick with whether it's espresso or filter coffee, you got 20 to 30 percent of extraction. Uh, for here coffees, here's Kelly's coffee in WBC, 12 grams was a, you know, best timing that we, we found, first 12 grams of the espresso, and uh, some of the coffees have been experimenting, you know, first 100 grams will chill, but the other 200 grams we actually do not chill. Um, yeah, that's the kind of extended version. Yes, and the reason why a light roast will be more efficient is when you roast dark, you are basically boiling off the volatiles. I mean, you're just heating the stuff, you're generating the first part, and then you, you just lose it in the second part of your roast, so that's why you will have less of the really uh, high volatiles in a dark roast. And that's why probably extract chilling will be less efficient. 
Yeah, so now everybody has to explore it um, because there is some data, but there is much more to be tried. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, we, we've experimented again for filter, particularly with a lot of different size balls of rocks. And uh, the the reason we we obviously gone for that round shape is it's because it not only it shocks the temperature uh, by having you know minus 20 degrees, as the Professor mentioned. Uh, we we found the range minus 20 is, is okay. Uh, we did not really find more significant difference in sensory, if it's minus 30 or minus 40, if coffee is on dry ice, as an example. Uh, so we were happy with that, that amount. Uh, but initially we did work with the smaller rocks, and uh, we, we found that as we extract in a filter coffee between 50 to 100 grams, the temperature of the rock uh, decreased a lot, and we did not have as good results as, for example, with this rock that we have now. Uh, and the and the shape really helps as well because it really helps to disperse the liquid over the rock uh, rather than just have one you know bigger channel and it, it really makes it really nice and thin and mellow and so not only the temperature sort of helps to cool it down but also the shape which is the conversation we had a long time ago in switzerland and uh, that you know professor really inspired me how uh, Flavor Tech, uh, which is a company based in Australia, how they work with instant coffee and the techniques that, that they are doing with the instant to maintain more aroma volatiles. Uh, some of our early conversations started with, you know, let's, let's actually see how we can, you know, try to use also the shape uh, to, to improve it. But, you know, it's a continuous thing. We, in the future, we are looking at different shapes as well. We, we test and see how we can improve it further. Yes, part of discussion was also to avoid turbulences. You want to have a flow that goes smooth over your your bowl and not like create huge turbulence with your extract because this could eventually increase the loss of aroma. So uh, the shape is probably very good. But definitely there is still a lot to explore. The field is huge, we're just entering it. Yes, so uh, when we extract, we immediately cool down the coffee down there in order to, uh, to keep it. So uh, we are trying to, uh, to stabilize the extract itself. And then the, I show you different techniques, you know, whatever. So we try to measure it more or less very early on after extraction, really shortly after extraction. And, uh, and I don't want to go into techniques, but we kind of really get the picture shortly after extraction for different uh, cooling conditions. I don't know if that's enough. I can give you more detail about the GC, how we do, or by, by the other techniques, how we capture the coffee, how we store it, how we measure it. It's a great question. So, I think it always starts with the coffee, right? Or what, what coffee we're we working with. Um, you know, sometimes with the traditional technique, we don't necessarily can push certain volatiles uh, to the level that we can see them and taste them. And we, we think that, you know, this particular coffee maybe does not have these flavors. Uh, but, you know, by, because these aroma volatiles are just below the threshold. We can't sense them, we can't taste them. But by you know, having the opportunity to use Paragon, we have a potential to increase certain aroma volatile or combination of volatiles, so we can suddenly see new, new flavor. 
Yeah, and uh, actually for espresso as well as for filtered coffee, and that's a statement from the people who taste it. They said if, if you let the coffee stand a little bit, the difference actually increases due to the cooling of the coffee. So I had a discussion with Mathieu, and he told me at the Century Summit, wait a minute before you give it to the people to taste, because I see a bigger difference after a minute. So the coffee had to, a little bit to wait, if it's too hot perhaps, uh, the, the differences are not that strong, so it's not something that disappears. And I showed you the sensory data that were done on the filter coffees, the one that had cooled down, the difference had shown more significantly the sensory. For the analytical part, we didn't wait, we really measured straight away. So there is a lot we can do more, but it seems that waiting, I'm talking now about a minute or less or something like that, is more pronouncing the difference than losing it because of the difference in temperature probably and probably also for the use of the capacity for people to taste differences better at a little bit cooler temperature. But try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, when we say creating new flavors, do you mean uh, the flavors that was existing in the coffee or is it just amplifying the current flavor? It's actually both. Yeah, great, great question. Absolutely both. Um, you know, one, and one of the things that's... Um, often, you know, as Kelly was saying, you know, competing for brewing, doing competition, you know, ordering coffees from so many different roasters and, and actually uh, brewing with these coffees. And, and often we would, you know, brew coffee with honey at the back and one would be chilled, extracted, one would be not. And you know, honey was wondering why why we why we getting these notes and these these new different flavours. And uh, and some flavors we we, amp we amplify them a little bit more, but sometimes you just get a completely new flavor that you did not get from that coffee uh, earlier. Uh, and and you know one of the most interesting things in, in Australian competition is that actually we managed to bring new flavors that uh, have not been extracted by the competitors, and uh, and that's you know that's combination of you know what that we could not get with a common technique, uh, and uh, and suddenly we push this aroma volatile or volatiles uh, above the threshold, so we can suddenly start tasting them. And again, it's really that's not going to happen with every single coffee. You know, coffee if it's slightly roasted. And if it has that potential to be to be amazing, we managed to push it forward uh, to sort of make it more, uh, yeah, more desirable. Uh, but I, I do want to mention that we are learning as well. Uh, I'm, I'm personally finding a lot of differences in the tactile as well. Like, we, for example, with some Asia coffees, um, by using chili, like we found the tendency that coffee suddenly has a little bit less tendons, so it's improving your aftertaste. And uh, make, making it attractive. Yeah, but from a physical perspective, of course, you're right. We're not creating aroma chemically smoked. We're actually retaining flavor compounds. But then, in the profile, you can actually sense new flavors just because of the change in balance. But physically, we're not creating aroma compounds. We're just retaining them. But that can be, you know. That could be then uh, changing the whole profile, and you get a new perceived flavor. Sorry, follow up. Would it also amplify the defects if the coffee has? Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, and and often we would have coffee that you know has a lot of defects. We you know we did not really want to extract chill that coffee with the technique because it, you just have so much more of them. So, and, and even if you have this kind of roasty coffee that are maybe a little bit darker, uh, you will see that more obvious. And uh, so it's not that you know, high quality coffee we feel it, it does some sort of improvement, and with every coffee it's a little bit different. Sometimes new flavor, sometimes more, more of that same flavor that you tasted, but just a little bit more highlighted. And in the same thing, if there's a defect, it, it is more obvious. At least in my sensory experience so far with the filter coffees. Um, sorry, please forgive me for being a little bit productive, but would it 
not make sense to freeze the vessel or chill the vessel instead of running the rocks? Is there somebody you could find a compromise there? Which the vessel? The vessel which you're brewing into? Yes. This is like, we, we discuss many things, you know, so what you have to do is, you have to reduce the loss. So you have basically, the whole concept is based on the fact that you are losing flavor compounds from the spout into the, into the, so the, the issue with filter coffee is that it stays actually quite long there, you know, so the thing that is coming down is actually sitting there and you actually can lose there. Uh, but you don't want to, to cool the whole filter, you know, so, uh, Ideally, you would freeze thing, you know, so that's what's happening in, there are actually, uh, that's why I said, the concept is actually known intuitively in the industry. So if you do red drink beverages, uh, some, uh, some companies just freeze or cool immediately the extract to preserve it for two reasons, to preserve the aroma, but also because the extract is very unstable. So you want also to reduce the chemical reaction. So it is actually done in the industry to cool the whole extract for instant coffee or for red drink beverages. Uh, in that case, we have many other options, you know, so we're talking now about one realization, how to exploit this phenomenon. And uh, you could cool your cup in which you do it, in espresso, or your jar in the filter coffee, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Kelly can talk more about this, but in 2017, uh, he actually froze his espresso cups and uh, run coffee completely frozen. Back then we did not know, but I do remember when we were in the semi-finals, you know, Kelly handed me his espresso cup and it was just most intense for how that was, you know, good experience. Uh, I was given that cup by Hedros or Sam Cora and I literally just started yelling at Sam, you know, why do you have parking or why did you wash your hands with this intense, you know, soap? And um, then later on we found out actually it's coming from the coffee. We, we also did experiment a lot with the cups, you know, what's the distance how long that a cup travels. Like I encourage all of you to make an espresso, run it, place your cup just underneath the spout. And if you have a high group machine, you know, have your cup all the way head long. And taste the differences because there will be differences. Um, the, the great thing with, with cooling the cup here, yeah, we can intensify these uh, aromas and flavors a lot. But when that cup is cold and we're running entire extraction, it makes me believe it makes certain changes in the interaction and balance, etc. Uh, you know, they can be positive or negative, but we found that we cannot really control chill extraction as well if we are extracting the entire you know, shot in, in the cold cup. And there's a traveling time uh, that we are losing our price in all the time. But yeah, there's, uh, you know, he made. <laughs> Super tasty espresso by, by using a very cold cups as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Do you want to finish? Uh, thanks so much.